Kratom, also pronounced as Kratom or Kratom. This gas station supplement or leaf or whatever you want to call it is synonymous with fringe culture. But several folks claim that it has a huge medicinal benefit. Let's find out today. Is this something that is overhyped, overblown, the product of a 14-year-old's imagination as far as efficacy goes? Or is there actual legitimate medical reasons to take such a plant? I'm Grant Harding, a licensed pharmacist in three states, and today we'll be learning everything about Kratom, the history, the chemical structure, and what some of the science is saying today, and we'll use that to determine my professional opinion, at least, on this particular subject. So what the heck is Kratom? Kratom is a plant. It's a tree to be specific in Southeast Asia. Eventually, people figured out that the dried leaves can be taken orally and gives you some pretty crazy effects. I was expecting this to be like a super old drug. Like I was thinking that, oh my gosh, the native Southeast Asian folks have been using this for centuries. The latest record is like the 1800s or something like that. It looks like the earliest records was like the 1700s. Compare that to something like aspirin, which has been around for 3,500 years. It's not very uh, comparable, really. The Latin name for this tree is Mitigina speciosa, I believe is how you pronounce that. The FDA put out a fact sheet about it, and the history shows that traditionally the Thai and Malaysian workers used this as, I guess, a release from hard work to overcome the burden of working too hard all day. The workers would chew the leaves to give them energy and help them throughout their, their work day. What people are mostly associate Kratom with from what I was able to gather here is it has like an opioid-like effect, and that means that it relieves pain. So then people like to jump to this conclusion that Kratom is great for treating substance use disorder, specifically ones that would deal with opioids then. Or, and or, people will ca call it a safe, natural, alternative pain reliever to uh, codeine or something, which is hilarious because codeine is a natural product. Like, codeine exists in nature. I believe morphine also exists in nature as well. Here's the problem with this plant. It's a plant. The leaves have not just one active chemical in it. It has several, at least 25, probably 30. Uh, depends on who you ask, really. That concept right there is a no bueno for medicine. In a perfect world, a pill or injection or whatever would have one active ingredient that would do one function. We want this so that we can more easily predict how it's going to affect the patient. Whenever you're taking crushed up kratom leaves, we have all these different chemicals doing all these different things. Combine that with intervariability between people, their metabolism, ETC, it becomes very difficult to know how they're going to react to certain doses. But out of all these uh, chemicals found in the kratom leaf, uh, the two that are most important and most researched are mitogynine, I believe, and 7 hydroxymitogynine These are the primary active so psychoactive uh, alkaloids in the plant. This idea of looking to nature for medicine is not new. As I mentioned earlier, aspirin comes from willow bark. We've been using that for literally centuries. Codeine that I mentioned earlier comes from poppy seeds. I myself, when I was in college, actually worked on a project isolating uh, chemicals from cyanobacteria and comparing them against human enzymes to see how they would react. The point here is looking to nature for medicine is a good thing, and we do it all the time. We'll find something that nature makes, and maybe it needs tweaked a little bit chemically or whatever, uh, but that's perfectly fine. The issue is just how much is going on here with Kratom. I mean, it's like you're taking a handful of darts and throwing it against five or six different dart boards that are all moving sporadically. It's just too hard to predict. But there's a lot of really interesting things about these chemicals, specifically the metagynine and the 7 hydroxy metagynine. For one thing, this kratom plant has been described as having stimulant and sedative effects, which is paradoxical, to say the least. From what I was able to find, at low doses, it produces stimulant effects with users reporting increased alertness, physical energy, talkative, and social behavior. At higher doses is where you get the pain-relieving sedative effects. 
Now, I was expecting these chemicals to look like almost identical to codeine and morphine, our like stereotypical gold standard mu opioid agonists, but they don't. Take a look at these. Here is mitogynine and 7 hydro Oh, am I pronouncing it wrong this whole time? 7-hydroxymitragynine. There's an R in there, apparently. Okay, they look very similar. They both come from the kratom plant. And take a look at morphine for reference. Now, virtually all opioids that we use here today are going to look like morphine. But these uh, chemicals isolated from kratom, they look completely different. Very interesting. I'm not the only one who has noticed this. I found a study that says that we also show that mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine are G-protein biased agonists of the mu opioid receptor, which do not recruit beta arrestin following receptor activation. Therefore, the mitragyna, mitragyna alkaloid scaffold represents a novel framework for the development of functionally biased opioid modulators, which may exhibit improved therapeutic profiles. To put that in plain English, it looks different and it behaves different than all the opioids that we use currently. Take a look at this image where the researchers kind of show just the pathway of how this chemical gets into the body and what it does. Notice at the end there, it makes the distinction between biased activation. Here are some of the other chemicals found in the leaves. Lots of different things going on here. Basic biology here, all these chemicals have roles, or maybe they don't have roles, in the function of the plant cells. Some of them may be byproducts or whatnot. It's just coincidence that if a human ingests these, something happens. You could think maybe, okay, well, maybe that's like an evolutionary toxin to protect it or something. Could be. I don't really know. I couldn't find an answer to that, honestly, what these things actually do in the chemical itself or in the plant itself. For example, in most leafy plants, chlorophyll, more like borophyll, plays a role in photosynthesis and energy production. Why does kratom have such a negative connotation? Well, it's because of the mu opioid activation. Anytime you're messing with a mu opioid nowadays, it's going to get a bad rep. Every single chemical that we have now in the United States that even touches a mu opioid receptor is a scheduled medication, which means it's controlled and there's several different requirements that have to be made for a person to get it. Most of them are Schedule II, which is the second most regulated category. Things that interact with the mu opioid receptor pre create great pain relief, but it comes with some risk. It can cause sedation, constipation. I know you think I'm kidding with that last one, but I'm not. It can be debilitating sometimes, the constipation that happens with these meds, as well as respiratory depression, which is very dangerous. It can be fatal. From the DEA, uh, from 2008 to 2023, mitragynine has been co-involved in 1,090 cases. Of those, 1,020 cases were classified as serious, and 593 cases involved death. Here's another study that I found. We also found that mitragynine and 7-OH display bias signaling at mu opioid receptors being selective for the G protein pathway. Thus, it is hoped that this scaffold may represent a starting point for the development of novel opioid analgesics with reduced side effects. We're all in favor of that. Relatedly, the finding that in addition to their activity at mu, opi mu opioid receptor, both mitragynine and 7-OH are Kappa opioid receptor antagonist suggests that mitragynine alkaloids or their synthetic derivatives may also serve as leads for novel dual action antidepressants. So that's something people don't think about. I mean, this could help with depression. If we isolate a chemical, maybe tweak it a little bit, or, um, you know, there's lots of different things we can do that could make this a very helpful chemical somewhere down the line. So, what are my thoughts? Of course, as I stated earlier, we have to get something a little bit more direct, something more streamlined. We can't be taking several different chemicals and expecting everyone to react the same way. So, I mean, the two that get the most hype here, the mitragynine and the 7 hydroxymitragynine with enough time, I think each of these chemicals may have a place in modern medicine. The fact that the structure is so different is really, really exciting. I can't overstate that. And the fact that it had a kind of a unique mechanism of action as compared to some of our current opioids, that's also really exciting. I'm sure somebody watching this has experienced Kratom. I would love to hear how you describe it. I watched a couple of videos and I saw other people talking about it, but I want to hear what you guys say. What? How did it make you feel? How did it make your friends feel if they could describe it to you? What do you think? Is it dangerous? I, I mean, I hear bad things 
quite often, honestly, from it. But I want to know what you guys think. All right, let's open these up and take a look at them. First, we have this thing. All of the uh, videos I saw on YouTube had lots of things blurred out, so I got to blur this out. But this is 600 milligram times two capsules, it says. Kratom leaf and kratom leaf extract. That's really all the important stuff it says on here. I want to open these up and see what it looks like inside. So, again, we got the cool little pill case thing. Um, this looks like hydroxazine. So, it's just some powder. I want to know what it smells like. It doesn't smell like anything at all. I guess that's Kratom. <laughs> These next ones are liquid. Here's this, uh, Speciolet. Oh, I remember this one. This, this is a chemical we didn't even talk about. So on the back here, it says five unit per bottle. One unit equals three caps equals 20 grams or 20 milligram of metrogining, uh, and 22 milligram of speciosilatine. This was a very, very similar chemical to mitrogynine. And it does contain just a tiny, tiny bit of 70H mitrogynine. Oh my gosh. It smells nice. It has a little bit of a fruity flavor to it. I like that. It looks really gross. Wow. This one says 150 milligram metrogynine kratom liquid extract. Five units per bottle, one unit equals three caps, 30 milligram metrogynine. Oh, this one has a little cap on it. That's cool. Oh, it's red. It smells like the same. In fact, this one might be a little bit more fruity. All right, let's try it out. I'm not doing it. Should I? There's no way I can endorse or condone this because of everything I stated earlier. We don't even know what's in this, really. If I were to take this to a lab, I bet I'd get different results. I found out recently that pretty much anything you buy in a gas station isn't what it says it is on the label. So I am a big fan of continuing to research and potentially isolate and tweak these molecules. I think there's a lot of potential there. I was super surprised about the chemical structure and what that what those treasures may unlock one day. But because there's not enough science yet and not enough education and research on these, I, I don't condone the use of this. So I'm not going to take it here today. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. This is very fun for me to look into. I get questions about Kratom all the time. And now I can confidently say I am excited about the, what the future may hold. That's how I could sum this up in just one sentence.